The year is 1988, and in Hargeisa, at the time in northern Somalia, MiG-17 fighter jets streak across the sky, back and forth above the city. On the ground, soldiers are going door to door, looting warehouses, shops, even mosques, where families have hidden their valuables. They thought they'd be safe, but the president, Siad Bare, and his regime forces are bombarding their own people from the air. It's supposed to be the final blow in a military campaign to squash the growing insurgent groups challenging his presidency, but instead it marks the beginning of a bitter civil war that will ravage the country for decades to come. Officially, it still hasn't ended. What happened an entire city, renowned as a mother of Somali art, has been completely destroyed in 1988. That's Dr. Jama Musa Jama, director of the Red Sea Cultural Foundation in Hargeisa. At the beginning of the violence, a young Dr. Jama left Hargeisa, where he's from, to study in Mogadishu, in the south of Somalia. Back home, his city is under a strict curfew, and taxis and cars had been confiscated. Thousands of families are finding ways to flee the city, across the border, to refugee camps in Ethiopia, or further away to Europe and Canada if they have the money. But there's one group who haven't left just yet. In the city's radio station headquarters in northern Hargeisa, a small crew of employees, regular folks like producers, technicians, and newsreaders, are staying behind to try and protect a slice of their city's culture before they escape. They're pulling cassettes and reel-to-reel recordings down from the shelves and packing them into boxes. In all, thousands of them. Now, some of those tapes will end up being sent to neighboring Djibouti and Ethiopia, but the rest are being rushed down into an underground room that won't be uncovered for years to come. Like something straight out of an Indiana Jones movie. They're hoping these audio time capsules will be enough to save something of the culture they're leaving behind. There was someone who thought that this is something so precious that we don't want to lose. I can't take it because I am becoming a refugee and escaping from the war. So they dig underground in the same compound and they put everything that they can get from the National Archive of the Music. The team carry these boxes up and down those steps into the underground room until they can't fit any more in. Then they seal it up and leave their offices for the last time. Some of them will never come back. The bombing went on for over a year and a half, and when it stopped, 50,000 people had been killed by their own government. The National Theater, the restaurants, the mosques, and the hotels, the very buildings that gave this city its nickname, the Mother of Somali Arts, were destroyed. But in that room, those tapes, a -a one-of-a-kind record of the country's golden age, stayed buried, hidden, until the war ended. Nobody would listen to what was on them for decades. Not until Dr. Jama came home to a recovering Hargeisa and made it his mission to bring them back to life. I'm Salim Rashamwala, and from TED, this is Far Flung. In each episode, we visit a different city to understand ideas that flow from that place. Today, we're exploring what was in that room and why, under bombardment, a handful of people decided to risk their lives and bury a part of their culture to make sure that it wasn't forgotten. Here in the U.S. and in a lot of countries around the world, when we think of national history, we often think of books or museums. But with Somali um, history or culture, it's often, you know, shared through songs and through poems. And that's how it's uh, passed down. That's Sausan Abdiallahi, our co-producer for this episode. She's a producer at the podcast Kerning Cultures. In fact, the Somali language as it's written today, using Latin script, only became a written language in 1972. That makes it about six years older than me. So naturally, when the cassette tape came around, it quickly became this vital tool for Somalis to start recording their rich history of poems and songs. I have to play some for you guys. You have to listen to some of them. Please. That's what we should do. Okay, let's do that. Okay, so we'll start with Kine Gardaran. Uh, 
and uh, the, this version is the Dor Dor Band version, but this one's a really another one that I remember from back in the day. That is a wide variety of instruments right? happening. I could see you almost singing along there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Actually, it ended up being a surprise for me because I thought that it was a love song, which it turns out it isn't. Um, which is funny because it is often played in a lot of weddings um, and I've been hearing it since I was growing up. So I reached out to a friend on WhatsApp so she could help me explain what the song is and give you the essence of what they're trying to say. He's saying to the girl, like, all the po- the fate, fate has brought us together, but the ball is now in your court. The lyrics describe an argument between two lovers. It's hard to break down because they actually are using some words as metaphors, so it's not literal. It starts out with him saying, fate has brought us together, but now the ball is in your court. I did you wrong, and you now have the upper hand, but I still like you, so let's make this work. She's, she's remembering all the shit he's done. He's done, he's remembering all the shit that she's done, and she, they're recounting it, but I feel like the girl is proper savage. And then it's like basically. I want like, your friend to have a podcast. I love yeah. proper savage as description of what's happening there. That was perfect. So, as you can hear, this music is really alive. You can imagine the scene in a seafront nightclub in downtown Mogadishu in the 1970s, hearing this blasting over the sound system as people fight for space on a packed out dance floor. But the way this music came into existence isn't as innocent or straightforward as it might sound. It involves Siad Barre, the president who was behind the bombardment we mentioned earlier. As unlikely as it sounds, it was him who kickstarted this musical renaissance in the first place. The end goal is to pacify the people. This is Liban Noah. He's the manager of Dur Dur Band, an iconic Somali band from the 1980s. So it was institutionalized and government driven because of the propaganda and that kind of stuff and because of the socialism era. So all the band were state owned. Quick clarification here. Not all the bands were on the state's payroll. There were a small handful of private bands, too. Uh, there was the Wabari, who is the top, top of that pyramid. Uh, and the rest of the groups that are, for some of the military, will have their own band. So Somali music was at its peak in 19, uh, late 1970s to the early 80s. While Siad Bari was in power, it was normal for government institutions to have a band. They recruited the country's best musicians and gave them all the resources they needed to make great music. They were basically civil employees with salaries from the government, and it was all part of a socialist revival that started in the 1960s when Bare first became president. How did Siad Bare come to power, and what was it like when he started? What did he say he was going to do? Um, so the way Siad Bare came to power is through a military coup. In 1969. And he had a lot of grandeur ideas. So he believed in the people. He believed in giving back to the people. But he was also a textbook narcissist and a dictator. (laughs) It's really wild that this person who was going to end up being behind so much destruction started out his presidency by cultivating so much creativity. But it was rooted in propaganda. And it was rooted in obviously trying to... At the end of the day, self-serve. But whatever the end goal, by the 1970s and 80s, his plan was working. This is Waberi Band, one of the most popular groups around at the time. They were the band of the National Theater. It says called October Wate Watedi, which basically means, uh, what's October? October is ours. Um, And it's literally uh, a a national propaganda song that was created to commemorate the month that Siad Bare uh, took power. It's still today, it's mesmerizing. Some of the songs, the best songs Somalia has produced, 
are the propaganda songs. And it's interesting because as I'm researching the song and I'm looking through um, some of the notes, I actually came across an uh, interesting comment on YouTube where someone's like, yeah, I, I recall listening to this song in my teens. And it reminds me of a good time, but also a time that's associated with pain. Which is a feeling Dr. Jama has too, when he listens back to these old songs. I hate the words, but the music written for those words was so beautiful and so moving and so, 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 so touching in terms of quality of the music, if you want. Really very hard to dismiss them, you know, because the, the trumpet, the music, the, the, the genius of that inside music that if you listen carefully, you can hear every little thing. It was amazing time. It's just, uh, there was not, I don't think that time will come back ever. It was amazing. One thing that was really interesting about listening to some of the songs, especially again, the Dur Dur band were, were very experimental. So you could hear, you know, reggae, you could hear calypso, you could hear synthesizers. You could hear music from, you know, rock and roll. You could hear it all. Um, but again, it done in a way that is very uniquely Somali. In our music, there are a bit of Indian, the spirit of Arabic, the spirit of Italian, the spirit of British, the spirit of classical, the spirit of opera. It's, it's unique, you know, this is like that kind of music. That's what produces, and that's what makes Somali music unique. It wasn't just the musical style that was going through a renaissance. Something else you'll notice listening to music from this time is that a lot of the singers are women. There was a time that uh, the female singers uh, had to change their name, and I'm talking 40s and 50s, uh, that they used uh, pseudonyms instead of their real name. But that completely changed uh, in 20 years, uh, where in 70s, uh, the female voiced uh, song uh, was the most uh, normal, but also most uh, popular thing that happened in the society. Somali culture is inherently Islamic, and by default that means that women singing were seen as haram uh, or frowned upon. And it was even considered to hear a woman's voice is aib, let alone hear her sing. This actually changed when Siad Barak came to power. He had socialist ideology that saw women and men as equals. And he actually created a women's liberation movement. I doubt that he saw himself as a feminist. This was something that just helped advance his agenda, in my opinion. And one of the areas that greatly benefited from this were the arts. And this is the 70s and 80s. So one of the main ways people would listen to this music? Cassette tapes. Radio stations did broadcast music by the most popular artists of the day, but there were virtually no private music labels. In their place, hundreds of small cassette shops around the Horn of Africa would record the music from the radio and sell it back to the public as cassettes. They'd even do custom compilations on request, kind of like Spotify playlists for the 70s and 80s. So you would go to this studio and you would say, I need a combination of three, four uh, renowned singers uh, and they will collect for you and then create the specific asset that you want. So that became a kind of a popular market and, and it flows immediately after the, the golden age of Somali music. So in 80s, late 70s, early 80s, you would see in every corner of the city, people who are opening this beautiful collection of, uh, you know, cassettes that you would go there and select uh, and they, 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 they make a copy for you. In general, there wasn't much of a concern for copyright law, partially because most music was owned by the government under this socialist regime. So you could look at it like a kind of tape swap scene that the government had no real reason to crack down on. People were enjoying their culture and their music and so we were progressive at, a, at the time. It just unfortunately civil war happened to us and uh, we fall from grace, I should say. 
In the years after the bombardment of Hargeisa, the north of the country claimed independence and took on the name Somaliland. But spiraling from all of the unrest, the country was torn apart by rival factions and degenerated into a full-blown civil war. During the worst of those years, the 1990s, making music took a backseat for many of the musicians of the golden age. The infrastructure was gone. There was no recording, no performing. No more, you know, uh, earning a living or, or feeding your family. Uh, I suppose the bad spirit has taken over the country, you know, which is, it become dark. Meanwhile, that room of cassette tapes was just sitting there, waiting for someone to rediscover it. That's after the break. Okay, now we're back to Dr. Jama, who left Somalia during the Civil War and became a mathematician in Italy. In 2008, he'd been living there for almost three decades. But there was now a wave of Somalis who chose to return to Hargeisa to help the city get back on its feet. And he was one of them. At first, he was mostly interested in books. And he started Hargeisa's first international book fair in 2008. I love book fairs, so I love that. He thought, if I'm going to bring my country's culture back to life, books are one way to do it. But he quickly realized, hey, we're an oral society. I should be looking at cassette tapes too, because a lot of them were left behind and forgotten at the start of the Civil War. What happened is the consequence that everything has been destroyed. Everything, including the archives. But as I said, where were the archives? First of all, this is small uh, music shops. And then you had the Radio Hargeisa. Nowhere else you had an archive of music. Dr. Jama, he also started asking people to submit their own cassettes. Many had been kept as kind of heirlooms in family homes all these years. And he asked people to bring them in so he could digitize them for his archive. And once you get known as the man who's collecting tapes, word gets around. People started literally bringing in boxes full of tapes, more than he could handle. And the miracle happened. Every single person who had some cassettes in their house came to the center and donated. Now he's got an office full of cassettes, thousands of them. Well, his office like literally sits in the center of the Hargeisa Cultural Center. And right next to his office is where the uh, uh, archives are kept. Um, and there's these, you know, floor to, to ceiling cabinets and you can see rows and rows and rows of tapes and you can actually see little writing on them like what the tape is about um it's fascinating and it literally at one point i it took one end of the wall to the other and they are not all music but they were also some other material inside interesting material that you wouldn't expect it. for example this is one of the tapes in his archive a radio broadcast of an old Somali poem, recorded on a cassette. And it says like, Tarikh da Bodari, and Tarikh da means the history of Bodari, and uh, what it is is the story of Elmi Bodari, which is basically um, Somali's uh, Romeo and Juliet, um, about this uh, man who fell in love with this woman, and, and they became star-crossed lovers. So is this particular story one of those things that would have been passed down orally? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the The way that this story specifically has been told it in so many different ways. It first started off as poems, which then turned into, you know, a story that people would talk about, kind of like our own version of Romeo and Juliet. And then, you know, it would then be told in the radio as a full-on play or story that you could hear. Um, and I love that it was memorialized um, in now in a tape that you could archive or you could find in, in, in Dr. Jama's archive. He'd be sitting at his desk cataloging music. And every now and then, rather than instruments, he'd hear an audio diary, almost like a cross between a letter and a voicemail, like a voice note from the 1970s and 80s. They were recorded at a time when a lot of people were leaving the country to go abroad because of the Civil War or the war with Ethiopia before that. So families were spread out across the world. 
and the 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 the, the educated young educated uh, person who is outside of the country do the same instead of writing a letter send this back uh, through these cassettes and surprisingly you are cataloging music cassettes and boom you get this mass this cassette is, which is a purely private uh, but you get something so you know powerful because it reflects the society your society how orality was so fundamental because it's more powerful more touching hearing the voice of your mother while you are outside of the country is much more than getting a message and a letter from it so he started cataloging what he had in a giant excel spreadsheet then digitizing just himself and a team of volunteers but they're only a small team and they have thousands of cassettes to get through and for example today we have almost 14000 cassettes collected here and 6000 only cataloged and uh, had uh, what's inside so properly cataloged and digitized so there's a lot is still a lot of work to do and this is where we get back to that moment that we started the story with the radio station employees frantically burying as many tapes as they could in that underground room. Those tapes stayed underground for three years, until 1991, when Somaliland declared independence and the Radio Hargeisa team unearthed them. But nobody had really been through everything that was buried. In 2009, during his tape drive, Dr. Jamal was tipped off about these tapes, that they might be salvageable. And could he take a look? And what he found was that, to his surprise, the tapes had survived. They were still playable. That last ditch effort, it worked. And we owe these men and women who did that. And then some of them they didn't even come back to Hargeisa after the war because of they passed it away. But they did something so fundamental and precious an act of heroism to allow us that today we can have these cassettes. One of the thing reason that it happened is because of this uh, you know the, the old things are always more strong and and difficult to to be destroyed so so I think that the quality of the material was also helpful in that way these tapes have been through a lot aside from that cinematic burial in the underground room there's just the passage of time if you've ever had old cassette tapes they get dusty and the tape can break or they have that tangly thing where you have to go back in and jam a pencil in there and twist the tape back up. Shout out to the 70s and 80s babies. Basically, there wasn't any guarantee that there'd be anything usable on them. If they waited too long, those tapes were going to literally fall apart. So that was an emergency which is a physical material say this material will expire so we need to do something urgent. Remember how we said earlier that Somalia has an oral culture? Well, this is exactly the kind of thing we're talking about. Music, poems, family histories not recorded anywhere else, passed down through these cassette tapes. So bringing those tapes back to life was the obvious move for Dr. Jama. He felt it was one way he could heal some of the scars left by the Civil War by sort of forensically resurrecting Somali culture as an archive. But after a war, there are a lot of things to repair, and people were asking Why is this cassette archive so important when the country still has so much work to do to recover from the civil war? But I felt uh, you know as a cultural center as an institution if we don't do it today we will not have the lecture and some of the first record you don't hear anything honestly but it allowed us two things to let the world know that we have such an important thing in our hands. and most importantly more than let the world know let the, ourselves know how important is what we have in our hands dr jama told us that for him it's about a bigger mission to bring the somali arts to as many people as possible i had one mission and that mission has been delivered let the world know that beautiful thing is there and we need to do everything to let it have back for the young generation of the people. A record label released an album of music from the archive called Sweet as Broken Dates. And a couple of years ago, it was nominated for a Grammy. At the end of the day, that arc is crazy. Live bands to studio recordings to radio to homemade cassettes to being buried in an underground room, 
all the way back out to one of the most watched award shows on earth. It's uh, it it put it back the Somali music in on the map of the of the, of the world. For me, it was uh, again after so long time, you know, it's Somali music recorded in Hargeisa in this dusty place of uh, that we love so much. Uh, is out there in the world and the highest level of, uh, of, of nominations. For me, that was the important thing. And now, a new round of work has started. And, and actually, what's cool, they literally launched a website where you can access these tapes. Um, and and eventually, eventually, you can sign up to be a researcher and hear it directly from the Red Sea Foundation and from the Hargeisa Cultural Center. And that, to me, is fascinating that you can pick a poem or you can pick a play or you can pick a song directly from the reserve and from the archives. From a literal box in an underground room to, if all goes according to plan, being accessible to anyone. People risked their lives to make sure these recordings lived on. And now Dr. Jama is figuring out how to keep making all of it meaningful today. He says he dreams of walking down the street in Hargeisa and hearing that archive music live on in simple ways, like playing out of speakers in corner stores and barber shops, living in the world like it was intended. That's what I, what I, I, I would love to see. And this uh, archive could be really helpful in that way. Put back uh, in the normal life uh, where the Somali music deserves to be. Far Flung is produced by Jesse Baker and Eric Newsom of Magnificent Noise for Ted. This episode was created in collaboration with the team over at Kerning Cultures, a podcast that tells rich, in-depth stories like this one about the Middle East and North Africa. Our producers for this episode are Sosan Abdullahi, Hiwate Gitana, and Alex Atak. Production support in Hargeisa by Ismail Oba. Our production staff includes Sabrina Farhi, Elise Blenner-Hassett, Huete Gitana, Ben Ben Chang, Sammy Case, and Michelle Quint, with the guidance of Roxanne Highlash and Colin Helms. Special thanks to Vic Sahoni at Ostinato Records for letting us use the music from the Sweet as Broken Dates album. Our fact checkers are Nicole Bodie and Paul Durbin. Ad stories are produced by Transmitter Media, this episode was mixed and sound designed by Kristen Muller. Our executive producer is Eric Newsom. I'm Salim Reshamwala. <laughs>